Well, and I think sometimes we forget that, you know, a tantrum, by definition, is a crisis. Welcome to Talking About Kids. I'm your host, R. Bradley Snyder, researcher, activist, and author of The Five Simple Truths of Raising Kids. Kids have been around for a long time. In fact, some of my favorite adults started out as kids. And for as long as there have been kids, there have been people offering advice on how to care for them. I am one of those people. Starting this episode, I'm introducing a new segment in which a colleague and I examine classic and obscure books about kids from the distant and not-so-distant past. We'll be looking at what has changed and what has stayed the same to try to uncover universal truths and inspiration that you can use as you care for your own kids. In this episode, I take a look at a chapter called The Bad Child from the 1920 book series The Kindergarten Children's Hour by Lucy Wheelock. My guest to help me with this effort is Kelly Ann Bonnell, the Early Childhood and Elementary Education Coordinator at Feather River College. Kelly Ann has an encyclopedic knowledge of early childhood education theory, but she's also a very skilled practitioner whom I have seen transform classrooms. This podcast was sponsored in part by the Arizona Department of Health Services Must Stop Bullying campaign through its Title V Maternal and Child Health Program. For more information, go to muststopbullying.org. And now, the interview. It really came back to my Head Start teacher. Uh, She was a woman by the name of Hazel Hakes. And um, she became so much more in me and my family's life than my preschool teacher. Um, When my mother passed away at 14, she offered to drive me across the country to, to my biological dad's house. And so, you know, I had this huge impact of the strong personality in early childhood. And, um, and that continued my best friend's mother in high school had her degree in early childhood and, uh, she played mother of the bride when I got married and her, you know, and so, so these strong women really guided me to, to early childhood. And when I got to college, I actually thought everybody went to Head Start. I didn't mm. realize that it wasn't any, it wasn't until I started my, my studies in early childhood that I discovered that the United States did not have universal pre-K. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that, that really is where my interest in early childhood uh, developed. Um, I started pursuing a dual major in theater and psychology. I was going to go into, uh, I was going to go into uh play therapy. And, uh, over time just realized that, uh, early childhood education was kind of my thing. Hmm. And, you know, my passion these days is informal learning. And so much of what early childhood is, is informal learning. So. Exactly. Exactly. And, and obviously, you know, I've always been a fan of your early childhood work. And so when I found this volume, I couldn't think of a better person to process it with. And, Today, we're going to be looking at um, a a book series or a chapter from a book series from 1920 by Lucy Wheelock. And the four volumes are entitled The Kindergarten Children's Hour. And we're looking at a very specific chapter from the fourth volume. The fourth volume is entitled Talks to Mothers. And this chapter is called The Bad Child. And, and just so I know, Kellyanne, when, when I said we're going to look at a chapter from a 1920s parenting book and the chapter is called The Bad Child, what, what did you think you were going to be experiencing? Well, the title alone really had me um, 
thinking I was going to be getting a Dobson book mm. or, a, or, you know, or, or, you know, so the strong willed child or, you know, an, a, a treatise on authorit- authoritarian parenting. Um, and, and I actually thought it was kind of, uh, really appropriate when you think about, you know, the title of this book and then your section on, in your book on, uh, on all kids are good, mm. you know? And, and, and so I, I, I immediately saw that appeal in that contrast to you, but, um, but really I would, you know, this, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. That right. was kind of what I was walking in expecting. You know, and I was too, partially because, I've, I've looked at these four volumes kind of out of order. So, and the thing I, you weren't privy to is I've seen the illustrations. They're very mm-hmm. 1920s. Um, but I'm going to start here. I'm going to read a, cha- a, a portion of this for the listeners. And then we can start to talk about this chapter. From the Bad Child. It is true that children are often made bad, by our treatment of them. In his autobiography, Froebel sketches a pathetic picture of a child constantly reproved for his restless activity and punished for minor faults. Quote, I was so often called bad, he writes, that I nearly became so. A wide awake boy transplanted from the genial atmosphere of a kindergarten to a rigid primary school was in constant disgrace. His efforts to help his mates were misunderstood and his social spirit rebuked. Quote, she blames everything on me, he confided in his mother, and I might as well do it. How many an active boy has a bad name attached to him because he is passed on from grade to grade in school with that character? Often, all he needs is a legitimate outlet for his activity and some absorbing work. All right, Kellyanne, what do you think about that? Well, I have to say I highlighted that section. So, so you, I mean, I know it's the, it's the, it's the chapter opener, but the reality of it is, is how many kids do we have today that are in this situation? Um, You know, I think about uh, I think about the work that Cynthia Tobias did in You Can't Make Me, But I Can Be Persuaded Mm. and her conversation about the fact that school systems are set up. So instead of the shoe fitting the child, we cut off the toes of the, 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 the child's foot to fit the shoe. Right. And, you know, one of the things that we've begun to talk about is should we in our year to year recommendations as children are promoted, should we be passing on behavioral insights? Mm. Um, especially when they're very young. Um, I had a, I have a, a colleague of mine that specializes in working with two year olds and she absolutely loves them. And she calls the year between two and three, the magic summer or the summer between two and three, the magic summer. Um, because the changes are so dramatic developmentally in a child that their behavior in the two-year-old classroom versus their behavior in the three-year-old classroom can often be day and night. Yeah. And, um, you know, when we pass on that behavioral quote unquote insight to the next teacher to prepare the next teacher for what's happening, are we truly doing a disservice to that child, not giving not giving them an opportunity to maybe have hit a development milestone, uh, discovered something new about themselves, et cetera. Well, you know, that's so interesting because often, I mean, one of the things that I think people struggle with is particularly around this question is there's, there's insights into things that might be difficult or triggering to a child that you might absolutely want to pass along. Um, I'm more familiar with this work in the child welfare world, for example, where mm-hmm. where we hear all the time from foster parents um, that they knew so little about the child. They didn't know the child's favorite toys, the child's favorite foods. They didn't know what the child was afraid of. And that kind of information I hear from foster parents would help them prevent behaviors and, and um actions that would be kind of harmful and detrimental. 
But that's different than in the education setting where I do believe that we're far too broad with our strokes. We talk about, you know, somebody being um, problematic or instead of um, this is what the child is good at. This is where the child uh, sometimes struggles or needs redirection. So I do think there's a fine line there for sure. Well, and I've been a, I've been an advocate for years about the idea of taking the social services model of staffing mm. children and moving it into the classroom. Um, I believe that that can be very important. And, you know, I think that, you know, it's not that we don't want to have the records in the history. It's that if we have that before we've met the child, there's a preconceived idea. Right. Um, you know, I think that in the after the first couple of weeks is usually when I go visit the teacher from last year. Um, instead of having, you know, I don't want that teacher to come to me. I want to go when I'm ready to go to that teacher to say, okay, now tell me about this child. Uh, tell me about this because now I have an idea of the identity of this child and I can begin to see where things, where things are and what needs to happen with them. Um, so that I have some very specific questions about, okay, how did you handle this or what did you do here? Absolutely. You know, uh, Wheelock goes on to to quote Henriette Delmer, and, and and I don't know Henriette Delamere, um, but she quotes this part of an article from Delamere where she says, "Never, no, never, under any provocation, whatever, allow a child to to feel that you consider it a naughty or troublesome one." And here. What I like about this is this is the shift that you know you and I know is it should be it should be common should be something that every parent that every educator anybody who is working directly with children automatically does which is make a distinction between a behavior and the child and yet so often people don't do that. They refer, they, they say, you are bad, you are loud, you are disruptive, not the behavior or that thing that you did was disturbing the other students. And here we are in 1920, two different authors making the exact same point. The, the, the uh, writer and the person that she is quoting are saying, never label the child with the behavior. I found that incredible. Well, and I think it's, I I think it's very true. I mean, you know, we have, we have a mantra and it is, you know, there are no bad children. Right. There are only poor choices. And, you know, when that, when that phrase was first presented to me, it was, there are only bad choices. We've Mm -hmm. taken the bad out of that completely because, because what happens is that, that terminology of bad choice too easily gets translated to bad child. And so by, by saying it's a poor choice, your brain stops for a minute and says, okay, my child is not a poor child. That doesn't apply well. And, and so it allows us to really begin to look at the behaviors and let a child know that they are always worthy of love and they are always good. And, you know, they are always, they are always welcome in a space those choices may not be welcome in the space. I've already shared a couple of the the, um, passages here that I found particularly interesting. Is it anything that that you read that that struck you as either particularly um, prescient and that it it applies today um, or anything that you found particularly irksome um, and old fashioned? Well, I found that this book was the foundation for authoritative parenting, this Mm. chapter at least. Um, And one of the things that really struck me was the section on the right theory of of punishment. Um, You know, the punishment should fit the deed. Yeah. Um, And uh, another great advantage of the natural system of discipline (laughs) is that it is a system of pure justice. Mm -hmm. and will be recognized by every child as such. And to me, that that, that conversation of natural and logical consequences 
is so important and gets so lost. Right. You know, we're 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 in a we're in an age where we're beginning to talk about parenting as gentle parenting or um, respectful parenting, and yet here we are in the 1920s, and they were talking about this. You know, there's right. a consequence that comes with that. You know, if you break something, you have to fix it. Um, you know, that, that piece of it, I really, really liked, um, probably the thing that I really had the most problem with was the scenario of, uh, when a, um, they were talking about for Bell's school mm-hmm. and, um, and one of the examples was that the focus was, uh, the aim at the school was to give boys self-control and self-direction. A slice of bread placed a boy's plate at supper, <laughs> or yeah, a slice of dry bread right. placed on a boy's plate at supper was a reminder of some neglect of duty. Yeah, and and I have what I have written beside <laughs> it is literally wrong with a question mark. <laughs> it seemed, you know, probably in that time period that would have been a very acceptable thing. Right. And today that is not. Does that mean that it was wrong? I, you know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, but it didn't set right with me. Well, it, and I want to go back to the, the first part. Um, and I'm going to read a passage because I think it, it's fascinating. And um, I had a, a, a similar reaction. I did go in a slightly different direction. Um, but let me read this. And in this case here, Wheelock is actually quoting Herbert Spencer. Um, Herbert Spencer, who was actually the person that coined the phrase, the survival of the fittest in response. uh, He was a big proponent of Darwin's work. He was writing at the same time. Um, And for a while, you know, maybe the best known philosopher in all of England, but he was, he was writing at a time when he was desperately and a lot of philosophers were desperately trying to find order in everything, this natural order that all things follow. Right. But he writes, again, when children with more than unusual carelessness break or lose the things given them, the natural penalty, the penalty which makes grown-ups persons more careful, is the consequent inconvenience, the want of the lost or damaged article, and the cost of supplying its place are the experience by which men and women are disciplined in these manners, and the experience of children should be as much as possible assimilated to theirs. Now, I read that, and I thought, well, this is what we've been trying to get at in schools with restorative justice, Mm -hmm. where we have consequences that match the deed. And the consequences are supposed to you know, restore and to use Spencer's, uh, you know, example here as an analogy, there is supposed to, if the behavior broke something, the um, restorative justice is supposed to be to fix it. But of course, you know, schools don't have any idea what restorative justice is, or even what it is that they're trying to restore. At least, I mean, that's a gross um, uh, oversimplification. There are schools that I think get it, but most schools, and, and actually, I have to be honest, Kellyanne, a lot of people that claim to be experts in restorative justice fail to figure out yeah. what it is that's being broken and what it ne- what needs to be done to fix it. It's the difference. Th- this is coming back to the natural logical consequences. Right. We're okay with the natural consequences, but there are certain natural consequences that can't happen in a classroom. Mm. The natural consequence to hitting someone is getting hit. Mm. Well, that's not an appropriate natural consequence to allow to happen in a classroom. So then we have to shift to a logical consequence. Well, a logical consequence requires that the adult think logically about it. And that's where you run into that. People don't always know what pairs with what Mm -hmm. to, to, to make that logical consequence. Um, And, you know, probably the example that comes to mind uh, for me, I was in a kindergarten classroom in the inner city and I had a, I had a five-year-old that was severely behavioral. And one of his behaviors was that he would, when he would get angry, he would pee on the bathroom floor. Mm. The natural consequence 
to going on the floor would have been for him to clean up his mess on the floor. But because of licensing and other regulations, right. county health, et cetera, a child, they, the, 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 they could not allow that to happen. So then what then becomes the consequence for that behavior that is logical, that does not involve that child right. cleaning up that mess? And, you know, and so, you know, and, and, and it becomes a struggle and there was disagreement on what that looked like. Mm. Yeah. I think that in order, I mean, those are, that's a really, well, first of all, you know, my, my mind goes into a bunch of different directions about that young man. And, and we know mm -hmm. that, um, that kind of wetting behavior can be the, the result of a lot of different early childhood traumas. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I think that's why when I go into a school and I, when I'm talking about a school climate, I'm talking about how you, the, the children have to be all aware of what that classroom is supposed to be and what those behaviors, the positive behaviors are supposed to be. And so there needs to be, in, in my opinion, and obviously in a lot of other researchers and writers as well, that you need to establish like who you are in that classroom for the students and you i recommend that you what you're establishing is that you're there to support each other for success you support each other in your learning you support your each other in your social development to do that you need to trust one another you need to look out for one another and so in those hitting examples what you want to be able to do is to restore the trust you're never going to get that hit back you can't unhit somebody to your point and, you know, allowing, even if you were allowed to allow the, the victim to hit the um, perpetrator back, that does nothing to restore the, the, um, the unity that you want, uh, the camaraderie that you want in a classroom where people are trying to support each other towards success. You know, I completely, you know, I'm, I'm right there with you. And as you're talking, my brain is going to a book that was written several years ago called Starting Small. Mm. Remember this? No, I don't know Starting Small. Tell me, please. Um, Starting Small was done by the Teaching Tolerance Project, which was okay. part of the Southern Center for Poverty Law. Mm -hmm. um, and what they did was they chose different classrooms around the country that best exemplified tolerance education at the time. Yeah. Now, of course, we don't even use the term tolerance education anymore. And teaching tolerance is no longer teaching tolerance.org. I think it's teaching for equity now or, right. or, you know, so, so we've, we've had some, some evolution in our thought process and our vocabulary, but the first the first teacher that's profiled in this book, and there's a video that goes with it that you can find on YouTube, um, is, uh, is about how a teacher brings community to an early childhood classroom. Hmm. And they do people colors where they have to match their skin and they learn that we are not black and white. And, we, you know, they, you know, we're cinnamon and honey and, you know, all these wonderful, lovely colors. And then they have to do a self portrait. And the teacher talks about halfway through the year, realizing that her classroom community was starting to fall apart and coming to the recognition that some of the children that had been part of that community building activity had left. Mm. And new children who had never been part of that community building had come in. And so she opted to start that process over again. So it wasn't just a beginning of the year activity now. It was something she needed to do at periods throughout her year to reset her classroom community. Right. The other thing that really struck me about, um, about the, the, the whole idea of this starting small and, and building classroom community was the idea that very young children could adopt a constitution. Yeah. And it was the, it was the idea that we're not talking about rules in a classroom. Right. And we're not just talking about student rights with every right 
comes a responsibility. Right. And a healthy classroom operates on that rights versus responsibilities. We may not use that language with a young child, but so like usually when I do it, it's uh, it's I have the right to be heard. Mm. It is my job to listen. I, you know, if I want other people to hear me, yep. I have to hear them. And, you know, and so we have to change the vocabulary a little bit sometimes, but citizenship starts yep. at a very young age. And the classroom is the, is the place where we can make that perfect world happen. Yep. Can't do it in the real world. So. Well, and it, it's just that the flipping of, so you go into most classrooms are going to have some sort of rules or code of conduct posted, but too often they're in the negative what not to do. Mm -hmm. And and you and I know that it's so much harder to not do, to, to do something when you're only being told how not to do it. You know, I love mm -hmm. the analogy and, and maybe you know um, the educator that originated this because I haven't been able to trace it back yet. But when I'm talking or training teachers, I talk about, I ask them to imagine how frustrating it would be if they were following driving directions on their phone and the, draw, and the phone only told them when they made a wrong turn. Could they ever get to their destination? I mean, it would be so frustrating. And yet our kids are sometimes, we treat our kids that way. We post a list of classroom rules or even home rules, and they're all things they're not allowed to do. And one of the first things I do when I go into a classroom is I get the teacher or the principal or even the whole district to be thinking about what are the positive things what do you want your children, your students to do? So you want them to treat all the other students with respect, to look out for them, to help all the other students succeed. And so even something as simple as, you know, I was talking with the school, they had this like, don't litter. Well, the positive is you want a, you're, you deserve a fantastic learning environment. So do everything to make your learning environment as beautiful as it should be, right? That's the positive. And of course, what flows from that is, well, then you don't want to litter if you're trying to make something beautiful. And I was so impressed. Again, we locked towards the end. Um, and in here, I think she, this is in the middle of what I think is her going off the rails a tiny bit. But at the end, she says, do is better than don't. Do suggests good. Don't suggests evil. Now here, where I think she's going off the rails here a little bit, Kellyanne, and you and I, um, through your other project, Pop Goes to Classroom, you know, we've, we've looked at comics. I think we're both fans of that art form's ability to communicate things. And here Wheelock mm -hmm. talks about the evils of comic strips in Sunday newspapers and, and how Buster Brown and Elmer's are, are going to um, <laughs> you know, create in kids a desire to, to trick and play pranks. I, I, I think this is where she kind of goes off the rails a little bit, but I 100% agree that do is better than don't. Well, and, and, you know, and I would concur. I mean, where I, where I take that, the comic book, the, the comics criticism of her going off the rails mm. uh, and bring it into contemporary is all of the criticism that, uh, that the Rugrats got. Yeah, yeah. Because they were off being mischievous children and the adults weren't there. And yet there was so much, there was so much richness that came out of, out of that particular series. Um, I think that um, the do and don't has a couple of things for me. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I always tell my students is that I'm the oldest of six and I have, we have in our family, a Kellyanne, a Joanne and a Diane. <laughs> so when one of the three of us were in trouble, what did we hear? You never heard the first half. The voice goes up for the second half. And so all we'd hear was, and, and then, you know, what, what did I do wrong? Right. And that carried over as I became, as I started training teachers into the realization that our voice does go up at the end. When we're telling somebody not to do something, yeah. what we're really emphasizing is the thing not to do. Yeah. Don't run instead of walk. Mm. Don't hit 
instead of keep your hands to yourself. Yeah. We emphasize that word at the end of the sentence. And so how can we possibly expect kids not to do, I mean, we're telling them right. not to do it, but we're emphasizing it. Right. And so, and we don't even realize we're doing it. And, um, and so it becomes a really, you know, just that exercise. Um, I'm teaching a intro to early childhood class right this semester. And one of the activities that my students will do in the lab is they will have to go through and create classroom rules mm -hmm. and they will have to phrase them in the positive. Now, by the time we get to early childhood primary grades, like first and second grade, um, usually the way that I do that is I talk to the kids. They're the experts in rules. Mm. And so we always start the activity with you're the experts. You've been, you've been in school since preschool, you know what to do and what not to do. So tell me what those are. And the kids will give me the don't hit and don't kick and, and, and all of those things. And we just write them all up on the board and then we sort through them and we say, okay, well, these are all kind of alike. These are all about not yep. hurting somebody and being safe. And these here are all about, uh, about putting things away and maintaining structure. And these are all about respect. And that's where our classroom constitution comes from. It's how those words end up. It's how the rules, the kids brainstormed end up becoming grouped. Mm -hmm. And of course I know how that's going to happen, <laughs> but they don't. And so I can actually have the constitution drafted and they never know it because then I'll say, I'm going to take this home and I'm going to turn it into a constitution. I'm going to bring it back tomorrow and we're all going to sign it. And, um, you know, and, and kindergarten, first grade, they're doing it yeah. and, and they get it and you hear it in the classroom. You need to stop that. I have a right to a clean, safe environment. Well, I think that, I mean, just even in your you know, vocalizing your example of the don't run, that like it, for me, um, it was a little much. Of course, I've got headphones on, so the voice oh, is, is, is ringing a little <laughs> bit, but I'm brought back to both trauma-informed approaches and to de-escalation techniques. And in both instances, you're wanting somebody who is feeling that they're not in control you're wanting to give them a little bit of control so that they feel less in danger. And just by turning the don't into a do, you're giving them something that can feel like a choice so that they can begin to regulate, which I think is so very powerful. Well, and I think sometimes we forget that, you know, a tantrum by definition is a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. The situation has exceeded the yep. coping skills of the individual and they are in a crisis. Yep. That means they've gone back to their lizard brain yep. and they are not in a place yep. where they can, where you can have a rational yep. conversation with. Them. And, you know, one of the things that we used to do in crisis intervention is we always offered a glass of water. Hmm. And the reason we offered a glass of water was because it was a, it was a choice that they had to make. It forced them from going out of instinctive and back into, they had to make a decision. And then once they had made that decision, we could then move on. So perhaps in our classrooms, we should be offering drinks of water. Absolutely. I, I know, mean, just that, right? that little step. Well, and, and even, and again, here, Wheelock, also, going back to Herbert Spencer in this, she talks about when to, to talk about consequences and acknowledges in 1920 that you can't talk about consequences sometimes when they're in the middle of that behavior, that, that the child needs time to calm down. She then, and this is this very, very fine line that we all walk, um, but she's citing Herbert Spencer again, again, 1920, over 100 years ago. And she's saying that we need to, to exact the penalty at the moment when it's most keenly felt. So that when we talk, and she's using penalty, it's not a word that I like, but when we discuss mm -hmm. consequences, we need to make sure that the child is in a the estate to actually understand, to process, so they can't be dysregulated. 
but it also has to be at a moment where they can learn from it. You can't be so mm -hmm. divorced from the moment that they can't even put themselves in the situation that caused the consequences to begin with. And again, it's, these are, these are lessons that we've known for a long time, apparently by this reading. And yet it's something that, that our teachers and our parents and our direct service providers today often struggle with. Well, God forbid we, 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 trust the experts on things these days. So. Well, <laughs> yes, you can. You know, that. Kellyanne, um, <laughs> I could talk with you for so long about these topics. Whenever I talk to you, whenever I go to one of your mm. workshops or presentations, um, I learn so much. And so it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to get to process this with you. And, um, and thank you for everything that you do to advance early childhood education. Well, thank you for having me. And it's always a pleasure to chat with you. So. That was Kellyanne Bonnell. For more information about Kellyanne, please visit our website, talkingaboutkids.com. From there, you also can find out about upcoming episodes, suggest a topic, learn more about me and my books, or submit your questions for future guests. Our theme song is by The Senators. For more of their music, go to The Senators Music. Com. And remember, kids are young goats and young humans, and the difference is that young goats are easier to manage. <laughs>